When you think of memorable entertainment within the Disney parks, what exactly comes to mind? All of them being great choices, but in this video, I'm going to talk about a certain nighttime show that I personally prefer to make a tradition when I go to Disney, and I can't wait to share why that is. Fantasmic was initially welcomed in Disneyland's New Orleans Square area on May 13, 1992, later opening in Walt Disney World at Hollywood Studios on October 15, 1998, and then opening in Tokyo Disney Sea at the Mediterranean Harbor area on April 28, 2011. Fantasmic, as you may have guessed, is a fantastic name created by Imagineers. The prefix may sound familiar to those who recall what's considered to be the first fully animated film titled Phantasmagory that was released in 1908 by French caricaturist and the father of the animated cartoon, Emile Cole. And even earlier than that were uses of magic lanterns in Europe around the late 18th and 19th century, known as Phantasmagoria, where the lanterns were utilized to reject images that were mobile and could enlarge or shrink themselves, all of this being part of horror theater that offered illusions of reality with additional effects involved. But on the whole, the term phantasmic refers to the imaginary. In fact, the original name for the show was Imagination, but Fantasmic was unique and was able to be trademarked. So, as you could imagine, the name does actually suit the show really well. Indeed, Imagination does involve formulating mental images that are conceived from reality and beyond natural senses. Within Disney's marketing of the Imagination, it's highly encouraged amongst their viewers and guests to immerse themselves into worlds unlike their own to live a supposed reality or to participate in fantastical case scenarios filled with endless creativity and innovation. We're talking about a company that has embraced the combination of animation and live action, which I have talked about in other videos, has embraced dreamlike scenarios and approved narratives of video games, films, and television, and especially in advertisements where your dreams could all come true. With more examples being included in this plethora as well. Because Disney. Noticeably, imagination is highly centric to the entity of the company. That includes the purpose of the theme parks and guests taking part in tangible narratives or adventures to escape from the real world, for the most part. In the original layout for Journey to Imagination, for example, you are guided to fantastical worlds by the Dreamfinder and Figment. It stretched itself beyond guiding viewer perception with sensory inputs in the midst of Figment's antics, which is what it currently represents. The parks are escapism at its finest, and obviously I can take any ride or show and place analysis over how it succeeds at every capacity, or how the costume characters you may meet and greet with are all within the inner circle of the company itself and are just as physically interactive in the parks. It's what makes the larger Disney community stand out for the various character designs, personalities, roles, and other aspects that make for all of them to be beloved in their own ways, especially when they're cherished in parades, merchandise integration, fireworks, spectacles, media, and the highlighted piece of this being their shows. The show starts off in its introductory narration with the implication that Mickey Mouse is fast asleep, where he finds himself in his own imagination and interacts with both his dreams and his nightmares. And it sounds like how it is. The show consists of Mickey in live action and animated forms interacting with other characters good and evil. Each IP presented is based upon a chosen, typically popular sequence from Disney films and then proceeds in an overarching montage. Actors would perform with pantomimic expressions and with aglib complimenting the heavenly choir that performs the soundtrack. Sometimes Mickey is in peril or is like, what's this? While animated scenes play or animatronics do their part. The clips do share beat changes in the soundtrack that start as uplifting, string-emphasized melodies to being brass-emphasized and increasingly louder in volume, then transitioning into a hybrid of both tones in the finale, all the while having the choir and lead enter at certain times to carry along the theme and complement silent instrumentals, not to mention the air-launch fireworks and friendly pyrotechnics for the show in the environment, fireworks that also come out of costumes and props, which is very badass, actual fire, lighting towers and spotlights that come from the floor that give Mickey Mouse his perfect Hannah Montana entrance on stage, digital projectors that are shown through mist screens that come out of water, jets, and oh yeah, water. 
and I love it. The colors are vibrant and full of life. The choice of films that transition and the intercuts of Mickey into the whole piece is wisely done, and I find the overall show to flow and be well attainable of Disney as a company, especially when keeping in mind that each show in their franchise locations and the other productions across the parks do pick and choose what properties to use. Furthermore, the rewatchability makes it great too, because they're able to watch it in different places and have certain segments that travel across be seen at a greater proximity or get to have different frames of mind for how Mickey's journey plays out. The dream versus nightmare binary opposition is especially marketable, and the ideal selling point for Fantasmic to global audiences because of the exuberant energy that's persistent through the entire running time. Mickey and Maleficent are also the two extremes of those comparisons to be against each other. And even then, the two characters are the only actors on stage that we see completing the climax, to where the over-the-top finale comes along and is spurred with glee and musically synchronized choreography, which I will admit is very infectious. Nonetheless, the reason why I go to Fantasmic more than other shows offered at Disney parks is because of how they embrace the sentimentality Disney gives to fans of all ages. And it also just doesn't fear being cliched. Its intention is to be captivating with visuals and the soothing, youthful atmosphere it carries through its production. Believe me when I say, you are going to feel a roller coaster of emotions all the while watching a talking mouse kill off a green lady who turns into a dragon that comes from the ground to exude fire towards the audience, only to be killed off by magic sorcerer powers, which used to be a sword, while evil dragon lady is screaming in misery. Again, it's badass for the right reasons. And even if you may not like certain aspects of the show, I feel like a lot of people are just left amazed that the technology we have today could literally make anything happen. What I also enjoy about the show is that it does have a through line. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the world of color, but it really is about water jets and mist streams fulfilling a montage of some sort. The narrative of Fantasmic, I find, is more open-ended and more abstract, but it does have a central character and there is exposition, some action, and then it's fun and jolly conclusion. The creative decisions and how the story presents itself has been commented upon, but to me there's no denying that seeing Mickey in various outfits with some of your favorite characters for about 30 minutes is worth a viewing at least once as a Disney fan. But I mean, if there was one means of constructive criticism I had, it's that if there was a better way to view it at Disneyland without fighting for any spot to sit at the show, or else you stand for all eternity. We are eternally grateful. But nonetheless, the mix of fantasy and reality has especially been utilized to Disney's advantage in recent years since the show's beginning, especially with Mickey as the proactive protagonist. Mickey and the Magical Map is a more concise daytime show of Fantasmic, with dreamers in a compass navigating with characters to spotlight. But if I were to mention that Mickey enters an imaginary place and makes him realize more about himself plot, it'd be Epic Mickey. Epic Mickey is the ultimate parallel to Mickey's own transportation into imagination. I love the depth and storylines amongst the character chemistry, especially between Mickey and Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, the larger scope of properties being appreciated, and the engagement into the direct actions of the plot being the perfect juxtaposition between those remembered and forgotten. It touches upon leadership, friendship, forgiveness, and fighting for a common good. It has great graphics that touch upon the traditional animation style of Disney with a modern touch. I like the dark neutral color palette and how grave the situations can be in the game. And I find the Shadow Lot as a great antagonist to be affiliated with other greats, like how Chernobog is featured in Fantasmic. Of course, both examples involve Mickey getting himself into a storyline out of curiosity, and the refusal of the collective wisdom around him. It's Yen Sid, by the way, but like, should we be surprised? But that's what's endearing. To a nine-year-old me going to Disney World for the first time and watching the show before my eyes, I was glued immediately onto the world building Disney could present because of this show. And it made me excited to make my own imagination come to life too. I also had a lot of sensory sensitivities when I was younger, so going to spectacles like a fireworks show weren't my cup of tea, but it did inspire me to look into a larger sense of visual storytelling through a tangible means that I hadn't ever seen before. And because my best friends were stuffed animals, and ones that I got from visits to the Disney store or even to the parks, led me to write a story about a girl who transported herself into her own imagination. 
Not gonna lie, it is very reminiscent of Phantasmic, but I found ways to make it more cinematic slash melodramatic and in involving the villain causing terror that threatens the existence of imagination. The concept actually culminated into a stop motion I made very early on my channel. If you'd like to see some of my ideas from that story I put together and how I made it come to life. So for everything I mentioned, I am truly grateful for this show and that it's become my favorite show on Disney property to watch in person or at least on YouTube every once in a while. And I guess I can only hope that Mickey continues to inspire many more in the coming years.